because everything they get in church they can do on their own. You'll get a much better sermon on the radio than you'll get from even most Catholic churches on a Sunday morning, huh? Music. You don't come to church for the music. Thanks to the internet, we can get the greatest of church music readily available with the touch of a button. Huh? So we don't come for the music. We don't come necessarily for the fellowship. I can join a country club. I don't need to go to church to see my friends. We don't come for the scriptures. We're all literate. We can all read on our own. So I don't need to hear a sermon. Uh, I, I don't I need to read the, have the scriptures read to me because I can read the Bible myself. So, I don't come to church for the sermon. I don't come to church for the music. I don't come to church for the scriptures. I certainly don't come to church for the collection <laughs> because I can give my money to any good charity that I wish. So why go to Mass on Sunday? Why? To receive the Eucharist. To receive the Eucharist. So I don't care if I don't like the priest. I don't care if I don't like the music. I don't care if uh, the sermon is, is boring. I'm not in church for any of these things. I'm certainly not in church for the collection. I'm in church because only there, on a Sunday or Saturday Vigil Mass, I can receive the body, the blood, the soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Protestants can't do that, so I don't even know why they go to church, although most of them don't. And even Catholics now, the majority of Catholics in the United States don't go to Mass every Sunday, even though missing Mass is still a mortal sin and always will be. It's a very serious violation of the third commandment. Keep holy the Lord's day. And it's not up to us to decide how to keep it holy. It's up to Christ and his church. And they've defined since the earliest days of Christianity that Christians gather together for the holy sacrifice of the Mass on Sunday. Not Saturday. Now, ask your Protestant friends where they get the authority to worship on Sunday. It's not in the Bible. You read the Bible, what is the Sabbath? Saturday. So why do you go to church on Sunday? Who made that change? The Catholic Church. You don't accept the Catholic Church, you should be going to church on Saturday. Like the Bible says, just the way Seventh-day Adventists still do. At least they're honest. You're not going to find the word Trinity anywhere in the Bible, and it's the central mystery of the Christian faith, one of the fundamental mysteries of the faith. There are three persons and one God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're equal and co-eternal. Do you see the word Trinity anywhere in the Bible? No. Who made up the dogma? In other words, codified it. Catholic Church. Pope. You know? A Protestant will say, I have here the Bible, the whole complete Bible. In fact, it's the Protestant edition uh, with all the Catholic books restored because it's the best translation, I have to say, the Revised Standard Version. I know that the Bible is the Word of God. I believe that as a Catholic. You believe that as a Catholic Christian. How does a Protestant know that the Bible is the Word of God? Did Jesus Christ write a word of this? No. How many Gospels are there? Four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. By the time John wrote his Gospel, nobody else was alive. None of the Apostles. They never saw the Gospel of St. John. Then John eventually dies by the turn of the century, around the year 100. And it takes another few hundred years before the Bible is collected, the New Testament, as four Gospels and these designated epistles of St. Paul, St. Peter, St. James, and so forth. Who made that decision? Was it Jesus Christ? No. Was it the Apostles? Did they get together and vote what books go into the New Testament? No. Who made that decision? The Church. The Catholic Church under the direction of a pope. It was the Council of Carthage that sets the list of books that we have in the New Testament. Now, either the Catholic Church is infallible, 
can't be in error when matters of faith and morals. And that's why we can say the Bible is the word of God and trust that. Or, if the Catholic Church is not infallible, there's not a Christian alive who can say that the Bible is the word of God. Because we don't know. Now, what language was the New Testament written in? Two languages, actually. Uh, Koine Greek and Aramaic. Yes, Koine Greek, which is the ancient Greek, the one we had to study in the seminary that drove me crazy, <laughs> and, and Aramaic. So you have Aramaic, which is the language Jesus spoke, and ancient Greek. And only the original texts are the inspired word of God. Not the translations, necessarily, because many of them are wrong. How do we know that the translation of these original languages is correct? Because the church has guided the scriptures for the last 2,000 years, right? There are many editions of the Bible. They're not all accurate. In fact, you have somebody like Martin Luther didn't like what the Bible really said. Faith saves us. So what does he add? He adds one word that changes the whole thing. What word did he add? Faith alone. Really? But James's epistle says faith without works is dead. But Martin Luther says, he's a monk who got a nun pregnant and ran off with her, by the way. I don't know who gave him that dispensation and who gave her a dispensation. Uh, but in any case, Martin Luther added the word alone, faith alone. He also said sola scriptura, only the Bible, only scripture. Wait a minute, Jesus died when? 33 AD. When did St. Paul write the earliest book of the New Testament, his epistles? In the 50s. The gospels start in the 60s and they're not finished until the year 100. Wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? We say, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, the Catholic Church or the New Testament? What's the answer to that? The church. The church. Because the church is already in existence for 20 years before St. Paul writes a word of the New Testament. And the church is in existence for 70 years before we get the last gospel. So obviously the Bible alone cannot be the sole guide of the faith. We need the church. And then we need the church to properly interpret the word of God. Or else we can go into error. The way thousands upon thousands of Christian denominations have gone into error. There are thousands of ways of being a Christian. One way of being a Catholic, the right way. You know, and when uh, a Catholic deviates from the one true faith, we know it. And we publicly admit it. For instance, you just heard the Archbishop of San Francisco made public acknowledgement that a certain very famous person in government can no longer consider herself worthy of receiving Holy Communion because she dissents, she disagrees with the infallible teaching of the church. And therefore, you cut yourself off from the Catholic faith. You can't call yourself a Catholic, but I'm a Catholic, but I'm for divorce and remarriage. I'm a Catholic, but I'm for gay marriage. I'm a Catholic, but I'm for contraception. Well, these kind of Catholics will go to hell on their butts. Because you can't say, I'm a Catholic, but. Because if you're a Catholic, you accept everything that Jesus revealed. You know, when I say we are members of the one true church, we're not a smorgasbord. Do you know what that is? It's like you go to a buffet, you go to Golden Corral. So many things to eat. They're all good. But I take this, I don't take that. I like this, I don't like that. And by the end of the line, I put on my plate only what I like. And I avoid everything I don't like. That's the way some people approach religion. Oh, I like the Eucharist. I want to go to communion, but I don't want to go to confession. 
I like marriage, the sacrament of marriage, but I want to give it up to be a priest. So they want married priests. You know, we can't have it all. You know, the Catholic, I always say the Catholic Church is not Burger King. What's the motto of Burger King? Have it your way. <laughs> That's the motto of Burger King. Have it your way. But we can't have religion our way because we did not establish the church. Jesus Christ did. So we have to have it his way. But there have been a lot of people down through the history of Christianity who want to have it their way. Name a few. Who was the first major figure that had it his way? Before Henry VIII, there was one other. He came before Henry VIII. Who was it? I mentioned his name. Martin Luther. Martin Luther, Martin Luther was an Augustinian <laughs> Catholic priest. He had as much right to start a new religion as I do. What if I start the Jerome Catholic Church and name it after myself? Huh? Or the Bjornian Catholic Church? <laughs> Father Bjorn Lundberg has as much right to start a religion as Martin Luther did or as I do, which means we don't have the right at all. And yet there are people who put that title on themselves. I am a Lutheran. Really? Jesus didn't establish the Lutheran church. A monk who couldn't keep his vows established the Lutheran church. He went off with a nun. By the way, one of his descendants, Father Luther, came back to the Catholic church and is a priest. So they put the train back on the track. Huh? Father Luther, yeah. I've seen him on television, so that's, that's good. A descendant of Martin Luther is now a Catholic priest. But, okay, so you have the first break, Martin Luther. By the time Martin Luther died, he was horrified that there were 80 different interpretations of the Eucharist. We say real presence, transubstantiation. What word did Martin Luther use? He didn't say transubstantiation. What did he say? Consubstantiation. He says somehow Jesus is really there with the bread and the wine. But after a Lutheran communion service, they put the wine back in the bottle, and they put the bread back in the bread box. They don't see it as real, the way we do. That's why we have a tabernacle, that's why we have a tabernacle light. You're not gonna find that in a Protestant church, except for very few exceptions, like the sweetest Lutherans and the uh, high Episcopalians. They believe in the real presence, even though they don't have it. Why don't they have it? Because they don't have the priesthood validly. They don't have a valid mass and therefore you can't have the real presence. Okay, so you first have this Martin Luther. Now there was a king in England, a 19-year-old boy actually at the time, he wrote a book against Martin Luther and all his errors. The Pope made him, gave him an award. What did he call him? What title did he give? Defender of the Faith. Defender of the Faith. In fact, the King of England, the Queen of England, still uses that title given to them by the Pope. Because Henry VIII, as a young man, he probably didn't write it himself. He probably had St. Thomas More write it for him. But he uh, was a defender of the faith. And for that, the Pope made him a special Catholic, gave him a title and award that they have even to this day. Although I heard Prince Charles uh, say publicly, oh, I don't see myself as a defender of the faith. I am a defender of faith. The faith oh, of the ha the faith of the Muslims, the faith of the Buddhists, the faith of the atheists in my country. In other words, he's a defender of what anybody believes. <laughs> That's not what the Pope meant when he made Henry VIII the defender of the faith. Huh? So you have Henry VIII at 19, when he can still be chased, <laughs> He's the defender of the faith. Then he takes a wife, Catherine of Aragon, a lovely girl, daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. You know, they're famous from the Columbus story, huh? And he's got to be rehabilitated now, too. So you have the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella married to Henry VIII, but she was first married to his older brother, who died suddenly. 
They never consummated the marriage. They lived like brother and sister. They never exercised the rights of marriage. And that's why she could marry Henry VIII. He thinks he was cursed because he married his brother's wife, but they had never been husband and wife in the strict sense, and therefore he tried to divorce her. The Pope wouldn't give a divorce, and so what does he do? He makes himself the head of the church so that he could give himself a divorce and marry Anne Boleyn, whom he eventually has beheaded. He has all these trumped up charges against her, and as much as he loved her, he hated her. And then he goes on to take four other wives. The six wives of Henry VIII, he killed two of them, and divorced a couple of them. The one he really loved is the one, if she had lived, uh, he, he, he she, she, she died in childbirth. And uh, she would have brought the church back. She was a Catholic at heart. And uh, I think if she lived, she might have had the, inf because she was validly married to him, because the other wives were already dead. So you have Henry VIII establishing one of the largest branches of Christianity called Anglicanism. Or in this country, what do we call Anglicans? We don't say Anglican, what do we say? Episcopalian. You know the word? Episcopalian is the Anglican Church, but when we declared our independence from England at the Revolutionary War time, we're no longer Anglicans because who wants to give their allegiance to the King of England who's head of the church? No, we're Episcopalians that in this country, the Protestants, uh, it's, it's the same thing, but they see, they're based on the bishops. Okay, so you have Martin Luther on the continent and his followers are now called what? Lutherans. You have Henry VIII making himself the head of the church and leaving the church. And what do we call them now? Episcopalians or Anglicans if they're in England. Uh, and he had some very great Catholic people killed because they wouldn't go along with his making himself head of the church. Who are the two great martyrs of the time? Uh, one was Thomas More, well, patron saint of our diocese. Who was the other one? Beckett? Yes. No, Beckett was hundreds of years before. Yeah. Yes. St. John Fisher. St. John Fisher, the only bishop who didn't give in. Even then, bishops had no spine. Huh? Some bishops. Because they all gave in to the king, except John Fisher. Thank God he didn't have him drawn and quartered. You know how they used to kill you in those days? It was horrible. They'd hang you, but before your neck broke, before you died, they'd cut you open, and then they'd cut off your arms and your legs and drag you through the streets. Then they'd put your head on a spike. It was hard. The good Christian. The good Christian church of England. Um, so you have the situation where the church starts to splinter. So the, we have the Catholic Church founded in Jerusalem by Jesus Christ in 33 AD. Then, unfortunately, we have the great schism in the year 1054, where the Greeks break away from the Catholic Church, but they go into schism, not heresy. They don't deny the sacraments. They don't deny the mass or the priesthood. So even the Greek Orthodox, like the ones across the street, the Theotokos, in their tabernacle is really the body and blood of Christ. Uh, they have married men becoming priests, but their bishops must be single, just like all of our priests and bishops have to be single. So they are a true church in the sense that they have the valid sacraments. Then you have the Lutherans starting in 1517 by Martin Luther. We have the Mennonites. You've heard of them, I suppose. They were founded in Switzerland in 1525. Then comes, 10 years later, Henry VIII, who starts the Church of England, he called it the Anglican Church, now the Episcopal Church of America. In Scotland, there was this real crackpot called John Calvin, who believed, John Knox, excuse me, and he was an extremist who starts what we call today Presbyterianism. 